Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Wealthy AF, the podcast where we cut through the BS and teach you what it truly means to be Wealthy AF. And today's topic is going to be the value of leaders, intentionality, building resilience, and loyalty with their teams. And today's guest is the Honorable Raymond Kemp, which is a, a retired Navy, right? We have we have a true leader here. Through 33 years in the Navy, uh, he was a fleet master chief, so he knows a little something about leadership. Raymond is a highly accomplished leader appointed by President Biden to the American Battle Monuments Commission. He is also the CEO of Kemp Solutions LLC, and with his extensive experience as a U.S. Navy Fleet Master Chief, Certified John Maxwell Speaker and Coach, RBLP Trainer, and Y Institute Coach, Raymond is a well-known keynote speaker. Brother, welcome to the podcast. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. It's an honor uh, to be here with you and with your listeners. Uh, looking forward to uh, the conversation today. Outstanding. Let's go back to the Navy, right? Where you, where I believe, and you, you correct me if I'm wrong with your story, where I believe maybe that your true leadership um, skills got developed. Tell us, why did you join the Navy? Tell us that story. How did how did that go about? I, I grew up in uh, Oklahoma, born in the Great Nation of Texas, raised in Oklahoma, uh, and I had an uncle uh, amongst seven aunts. And in the 70s, when I grew up, um, high blood pressure was, you know, highly talked about. I mean, all my aunts would go off to work in the summertime. I'd be staying with my cousin and my uncle. He would stay home. And I thought to myself, well, that's the job I want. They're going off and doing all this work. I'd much rather just be at home telling, you know, the kids to go pick up some twigs from underneath the tree and bring in baby carrots from the garden. And I discovered that what happened, and she had already done the work. He was a military. He he had served. He was a Mumford Point Marine, by the way, uh, and had served over 30 years himself in the military. And I thought, well, that's a pathway that I'm interested in. And so I took the test. Uh, the Navy, Oklahoma was a landlocked state, by the way. So it's weird for a, 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 a person from Oklahoma, you know, to go to the Navy. But um, the recruiter for the Navy was very aggressive and provided me with great information. It was the right way to go. And so I left. Uh, my home at 17 after I graduated from high school, uh, joined the world's finest Navy. And a lot of the things that made me the, the young man that I was at the time came from being raised by a single mother who was an absolute fierce angel uh, and my aunt and my grandmother I mentioned to you before. And so I had seen what leadership looked like and I, it, and I was an athlete. And so I, I joined the Navy. Um, I had the opportunity to, to lead from the fourth day in the Navy just by volunteering to be a squad leader. And it was there that my skill set was honed into something usable uh, within. So what year did you join? I, I joined in 1986. It just so happened to be the same year that uh, Martin Luther King's birthday became uh, a holiday. Uh, okay. And, and strangely... Uh, it was still a very um, discriminatory time. Uh, so if you think about 20 years before that, 1966, mm -hmm. well, that was the level of uh, the, the people who were in high-level leadership positions, that's when they joined. They still had that mindset, sadly. Yeah, and, and that, that leads to my next question. So how does a, a person of color, how did you deal with the discrimination and the racism in the environment at that time? And how does a person of color rise to the level of rank that you did, especially in the time that you went in. So the, uh, just say a quick story, just to kind of exemplify some of the things, some of the beginning, just some of the things that I endured. So I got to my first ship. It was an aircraft carrier in uh, Philadelphia. And when I went into the office where people get distributed into their workplaces. Now, uh, again, I joined the Navy. I went to what we would now call IT school. Uh, I graduated at the top, near the top of my class. And so I had choice of orders. So I chose to go to Philadelphia um, and uh, to this particular aircraft carrier. Five of us got there. Um, when I walked in to see the person that was distributing us, he said to me, so I guess you think that you're somebody, huh, boy? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm looking down at the desk. He's got my record. I know he knows that I'm top of the class and so forth. And I said, well, I, I graduated top of class and I chose you know, these orders. Now, the, just to set the scene, he's got the Confederate flag over one shoulder and the Auburn, uh, burn, I mean, burn orange and, and cream, you know, flag of the Texas Longhorn. So I knew 
who I was dealing with, not just because of his accent and the way that he talked, but I knew the type of man I was dealing with because I'm from that place. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said, well, I don't allow any kimps into my computer room, so you, boy, are going to be going over here and doing this manual labor. Um, now, I, I don't want to, to insult you, certainly, much less your listeners, but there's a word in the American vernacular that's so polarizing and hateful that we don't even use the word anymore. We just use the letter that that word starts with. And that was the language he used. He didn't say, I don't want any kemps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't allow any kemps into the computer room. I don't allow any insert word mm-hmm. in the computer room. And so from the very beginning, I realized that some of the things that I had grown up with were still present in what I thought was going to be a meritocracy. Now, the way I cope with that is by remember at that at that young age, again, I'm barely 18 years old. What I the way I coped with it was through a poem, you know, that many of your listeners and probably you have heard as a child. You know, six and stones may break your bones, but but mm-hmm. words, even that word, can't really harm me. And so I thought, well, in spite of what he says, my responsibility is put my hand to the plow do my absolute best. Uh, so again, I'm believing that there's a meritocracy here and go to work. What, the way that worked out was I, I wasn't the full disclosure and you know, the Navy folks who know me might, <laughs> they might have something to say about this, but I didn't really like computers. I did like the competition. Though. Who can be the best? Who can be the most innovative? Who could be the most creative? And so in spite of the people who thought that they would be able to kind of bury me and put me away, you know, I was able to be the seed that I was brought up to be and, and grow uh, to the highest levels of the Navy. That is mindset. That's yeah, a long answer, but mindset. Great answer. The belief is really the answer. I want to talk about that. We live in a time, we live in a, in a really weird time. Let me give you an example. I was reading this post the other day on Instagram or somewhere, and the post said it, it, it was a meme and it had baby boomers pushing uh, this adult man with a beard and everything like in a carriage. They had some, the, the, the words, the language they used. What was insinuated was that millennials are still living with their, with their parents and that their parents are taking care of the kids still. And in the comments, it was just, to me, it was just disgusting. When I looked at the comments and I saw, oh, the baby boomer generation has all the wealth. We can't buy houses because they have all of the wealth and we're stuck and all these excuses, right? To me, that is the total opposite of leadership. Yet here you were as a young man, 18 years old. When I, when I looked at that post, I remember when I bought my first house, my wife and I bought our first house in the year 2000. We were only 20, 21 and 22. I was making $40,000 a year. We had two kids, third on the way. And my mortgage is $2,153 per month, okay, with one breadwinner. And here are these these folks on the internet complaining. And it, like every generation had that issue of affordability and challenges. Every generation. You grew up with straight up racism, like straight up hosing people down. I mean, you, it was, you saw it. You saw, you lived the roughest. You saw it as a child, the worst. What advice are you telling, right? You, you're giving to these young people because these younger folks that they, they, they feel like they're victims, yet you were called the N-word the mid, and you were graduated at the top of your class. And not only did you overcome that, you raised to the top of the ranks in your, in your right. field. First and foremost, I would say that, first of all, congratulations on uh, being in an environment in the early 2000s where you were able to uh, purchase a home, uh, and then having that thing, that unspoken, intangible, hard to define thing inside of you that said, I believe. Mm-hmm. See, the three things that I give to young young leaders, uh, and I remind older, more seasoned you know, executive, executive people to lead with, is that what I would call the ABCs of leadership, right? Attitude, belief, and character. Those are three things that no one can take away from you. And if you defend them with ferocity, then you can maintain them at every, any level that you want. Uh, attitude, belief, and character. Now, it's popular to say that attitude determines your altitude. And I fully agree with the mindset, the attitude 
of I can overcome and I can do my absolute best regardless of what the standard is in an organization or with a particular group. If I do my best, I ought to have that satisfaction and fulfillment that comes along with that. Believe, you know, that it, I grew up in the South to say, if you, if you believe, you can achieve. Mm-hmm. Even in spite of us just coming out of these winning, so-called winning our civil rights, uh, knowing that if I believe that I have the tools, parts, and material to do my best work, if I believe and therefore know that I am capable and able to uh, take the next step forward, or as Martin Luther King would say, you know, to climb a, uh, a dark stairwell, I, yeah, climb a dark stairwell, you must first take a step, right? And so if I can believe those things, um, then I can pursue the desires of my heart as well as make tangible steps towards it. And then lastly, in the ABCs, that is is character. Knowing that no matter who's watching, if I live my life and behave and speak uh, in such a way that is of high character, that character is going to precede me. And so what happened for me, yet again, in the, the in my naval career, uh, is that I I maintained a good attitude. I maintained and believed that I was just as good as anyone else. By the way, I grew up on the west that. side of Oklahoma City. I was the only black kid at my school, the only black person at my school, not a teacher, not uh, the trash man, not the male dude, nobody, just me. Uh, my mother used to say, you're just as good as any of them. Well, I was crazy enough to believe that. Um, now, there were times full disclosure because I'm just a truth teller is what I am. Mm-hmm. There were times where I just didn't believe and I felt like the man, you know, was holding me down. But then I realized the harder I tried to, you know, push against whatever that challenge may be, I realized that it was just my willingness to be prepared. It was just my willingness to you know, sacrifice and work harder that would allow me to, to get there it was my willingness to be creative innovative and build relevant relationships that also was part of it because working harder or smarter is not always the only way. Sometimes it requires relationships, sponsorship, uh, it's popular now to say allyship Mm -hmm. uh, is important for our character uh, to precede us. Uh, And that is the encouragement that works in any era. So as we look back historically, there have been whether it be misogyny, you know, we're, we're not very far, you know, from um, the, the women's suffrage movement. Yeah, we're very you know, near to the civil rights movement. And there have been people who are billionaires, the finances is what you're looking for. There are people with a high level of emotional peace. Um, and it's up to us to take those steps to attain those things that we have a desire for. And I fully believe that there are some things that we need for help whether it be some measure of affirmative action uh, or some consideration based on uh, you know some some challenges that we may have because there's still inequity so uh, mm-hmm. in the socioeconomic status there's still some inequities when it comes to schools and the education processes and books that you know the, mm-hmm. some children in inner cities and other places are learning from but when when we have the opportunity to get into the room or when we have the opportunity to get into that workplace, those ABCs allow us to rise and compete with anyone at every level. I love that. There's so much to unpack there. There's one thing that stood out to me is those inequities, right, that we still have. And how do we help young people? How do we deal with that, right? So how do we deal with those inequities? I believe they are out there. They absolutely are, right? I'm a person of color. I've experienced, I experienced, I just choose not to believe like yourself that because of the way I look that I'm less advantaged. I just reject that notion, period. Like, man, if, if they can do it, I can do it. If someone else can do it, regardless, I just look at human beings. If another human being can do it, but God's given them a talent. God, what is it that I need to be doing? It's the questions I'm asking. What is it that I need to be doing to get to the next level? What is it I don't see? What is it I don't know? What is it I need to learn? What's the skill? What's the thing? <laughs> My business. Name clock, man. I read you, you. You may think that you have put a block in front of me, but that block is only there until I have figured out my way either through or over or under or mm-hmm. around mm-hmm. or whomever might be able to help make my way 
beyond that. And that self mastery is just so important. It's so important that we know uh, who we are, you know, to let our own self be true, know who we are, to be continuously working for improvement on ourselves. And what I tell young people is a perspective that I wasn't taught. I just figured out because I was on the grind. I was, you know, climbing that mountain seeking to be better. You know, my, to me, success looks like um, being able to find a better way and share it with other people. And, and very natural, this is just my why, my, my finding a better way. And then the way that I do that, how, my why, how, and what, my how is I challenge the status quo and traditional thinking, but what I bring is a contribution to others. And so the way I apply that, and I'm talking to young people who are being fed this victimhood, mm -hmm. is look, you just assess yourself uh, and drive towards whatever that thing is that you have a desire for. And when you come up with the roadblock, then reassess and then, you know, change course and speed and, and find your way around it. Now, specifically, let's just talk about that. Right. So, cause I know that on your show folks want, you know, okay, what do I do? Exactly? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm part of the Navy federal credit Union, and a report came out last year that said that Navy federal credit union was giving, um, what was not giving loans, home loans at, at an equal you know rate if you broken down by demographic. So my encouragement to someone who perhaps was turned down by Navy Federal Credit Union, if that's who they belong to, okay, but they're not the only show in town. Let's let's realize, okay, I, that may be a no from them. Well, I'm willing to ask you know five, six, seven, eight, ten, t ten more times, uh, and then learn along the way what may. Um, be a challenge for me with regard to credit score or the other things that they assess. But that there's not one person who can say yes or no. I can go to another bank or even to another credit union or another lending institution and find the success that I want. And so my encouragement is rather than having that victim uh, mindset to have a growth mindset and realize, okay, they said no, Here's the reason that they gave me why I'm going to, in the meantime, while I'm working on that, I'm going to ask this next institution and the next institution. And the next thing you know, I can be, you know, like a uh, young mind for Dermo and his wife and have my own house. <laughs> so it's, it's a matter of keeping going. I, I like to call that a matter of having, re being resourceful, right? Being, it's resourcefulness, right? Like, hey, you know, I'm in, I'm in the real estate business. I buy, I buy uh, apartment buildings and, you know, it's, it's, it, if it were easy, everyone would do it. it it's not easy. Sometimes we're, we're redeveloping buildings and we're doing big jobs and we encounter a lot of problems, a lot of challenges with city, with contractors, with this, with that. And the the thing that I always draw to is I am resourceful. We're going to figure this out as a team. Guys, and I put my team together and it, we're resourceful. And that's just part of my values as a leader to, and I, and I, and I impart that into my team. Resourcefulness is one of our values. You know, I, I had a, right now we're going through an issue. I'll share this with you. We're going through an issue. We're doing a, um, a, a big redevelopment in an apartment building. And one of the things we were having issues with, my project manager calls me last week and he's like, we can't get the main shutoff because we got to do electrical on the whole entire building, all 12 apartments. We can't get the main shutoff. We're calling the distributors and they're saying 300 days. I got a loan that's due in 60 days, okay? <laughs> I'm like, listen, that's absolutely, I absolutely reject that. We're not going to, we're going to find it. There's someone out there in the world that has this part that wants to sell it to us at the price we want to buy it. And we're praying for them. They're praying for us. And we can put it in God's hands, to put us together and give us the part. I don't care if I have to fly to China, if I got to fly one of you guys to Europe to go get the part. We are getting it done. So I'm not accepting that as an answer. 300 days is not an option. The, that positive energy is real. The mm -hmm. believe and you can achieve is real. And when you're able to apply that same measure of confidence and energy towards your team, we had a saying on board Truman and we used to say, uh, USS uh, Harry S. Truman. Uh, and it was, it's we, not me. Uh, and when we you know, link arms together, we cannot be defeated. And so when you're able to inspire that within your team, man, good on you. I mean, you can, you can find what you want and have it. 
Yeah, 100%. I just, I, I owe some of this to my business partner. She just doesn't take no for an answer. She's a freaking pit bull. <laughs> she just like, she, she's, a, she's a doctor. She's a subject. She's just a pit bull. She's like, no, I'm not taking that answer. She just goes, right? So a lot of it is that I learned from her where, where it's like, no, we got to find, like, we, we find a way. I, I saw an interview with you, Ray, where you were saying, persistence over resistance um in an interview i think it was the day that you you retired your 33 years in the navy and um how has that contributed to your success that persistence over resistance statement and tell me what does that mean persistence over resistance to you what that means to me is that I, i'm not going to lament over a challenge uh, i'm not going to be sad because someone is pushing against me or something doesn't happen easily uh, in fact, I'm going to be inspired and motivated to overcome. Uh, the thing about leaders is that leaders are willing uh, to go the hard way and to go the long way so that others can find a better way to get there. And so that persistence over just the number of people who were like that first person uh, who told me that, you know, he didn't uh, allow folks like me you know, into the computer room that continued throughout my career. And I, it, I was not bothered by it because I realized that as I continue to show and, and bring high quality to the table and build a team that had high quality, you know, into those environments that they would be successful no matter what. And so that persistence over resistance and, and being able to fuel myself with, with words, I too am a believer. So to be able to fuel myself with, look, you will reap what you sow. Uh, I'm not going to be sad that I plant trees that bear fruit that I'll never taste because somebody's going to reap a harvest well beyond their imagination. And that's okay with me. It's more important to do uh, the right thing than it is to do things right. Um, and so there are times in leadership where we must ask for forgiveness after 100% for permission. And so uh, that persistence of resistance is that I will ruthlessly execute the performance of my duty to the absolute best of my ability, maximizing my resource until we as a team are successful. And leaders who are innovative and whether it be in the private sector or within the military um in the military there's a lot of you know, x's and o's there's a lot of checks and balances a lot of left right lateral limits and in the private sector there's uh, a, a bit less uh, of that formality but there's still laws in place and performance reviews that need to be uh, attained and maintained but when it comes down to our willingness to continue to work hard that's up to us um, there's, there's 10 two letter words that I use and I would normally close with this, but I think it's the appropriate time to apply it now. 10 two letter words that will make people, you know, better leaders, better people. Uh, those 10 words are, if it is to be, it is up to me. If it is to be, it is up to me, takes the pressure off of everybody else. That means that I'm going to do my best with the expectation that only I and my team and my resources are able to solve the problem. And that was, has been my mantra for many years. That's a great mantra. That, that's a great mantra. Uh, really, really good. Actually, I like it. I'm, I'm, I'm processing it right now for my team. Like, hey, how can we infuse that in the organization for all of us to take that level of accountability and ownership? Having that intimate level of accountability, because my, my inner circle, will be honest with you, is smaller than the Cheerio. But having that measure of accountability and vulnerability is what that all looks like. Uh, creates a team you know, that just cannot be stopped. And th the willingness to do that, you know, it's, it's become popular and many people have gotten the credit for saying that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Um, but it's real. When we care for one another, enough to use those two and two-letter wars towards something that we're working um, on as a team, you know, that's a measure of loyalty and resilience that sorry to break. I would imagine that you probably have a bunch of other stories as a person of color in, in the Navy, going up the ranks, how did you manage going up to the level of status and leadership that you got to having those subordinates? I know you had them, but you admit it or not. I know they were there. Having those subordinates that looked at you like, why is this guy, you know, leading me? I'll share this with you. This was, uh, his, his name was Titus. So if you're listening, Titus, big up to you. Love you, brother. And he took me under my, under his wing. He saw something in me. And 
just to give the, you and the listeners a picture, he was about five foot seven, short guy, Nigeria from Nigeria, from a uh, black, really dark, as black as my shirt is. The only thing you'd see on Titus, Titus, you know, we would joke about this all the time. So, uh, is when he smiled with his teeth and, his, and his, we would joke about it, his eyes. But this guy had such an art. He was such a great leader, right? He was such a great leader. He rose through the ranks really quickly. And to give you an idea, we would go on sales calls to Brooklyn. I used to live in New York City. We would go on sales calls to Brooklyn, to the, the Hasidic Jew community, right? Jew, the Jewish uh, culture. And they're very tight niche, as you know. And one day we go into an appointment, a sales call into this house. We were selling life insurance. And that's when I saw the magic, man. We were there and he's such a charismatic, such a great leader, such a, just, just knew how to connect with human beings. Within an hour, the, the, the kids of the household were sitting on his lap playing on his computer. And I was like, this guy is just magic, right? Like, they, like this guy is just like, he took me under his wing and he taught me as an older brother, he taught me how to navigate some of those challenges. I'm curious to know how you navigated those challenges when you were building a leadership, when, when you were building a team as a leader, where you had those people. The U.S. Navy is a tribe of tribes. And as a surface Navy person who goes on board an aircraft carrier, for example, the aviators would say, ah, he's a surface guy. Uh, the submariners or the nuclear power folks would say, ah, he is, you know, a fresh air guy. Uh, the thing that is important, there's three things I think that are important when it comes down to bridging gaps. I bring up the tribe of tribes because throughout my career, I was in eight different specialties. So from anti-submarine warfare to uh, naval aviation to your surface warfare and, and amphibious warfare and so forth. Space, uh, space command before we had the space war. The thing that I know is that there's there's three things um when it comes down to dealing with those environments when someone is looking at you as if you have been perhaps given something that you didn't deserve because of the color of your skin or they just think that you're inferior to them uh this lesson was taught to me by this guy named steve millar um we i was on board a ship and i i'm about you know different than than uh than your guy mm -hmm. yeah i'm about six six two um about 250 pounds worth of this. Mm -hmm. And so as I was talking to Steve, who I looked at as one of the meanest dudes I had ever met in my life, this guy was, he was so mean, I thought. And he said, Ray, look, man, you're, you're really passionate about things. And we have had a pretty um, passionate meeting earlier. And he said, but man, you're a big dude and you're scary. And, and I grew up, I joined the Navy. Again, we mentioned earlier in the show, I was 18, I was 17 at the time. I was 135 pounds. Well, now I'm up, you know, 240 pounds worth of weightlifting. And so my appearance was very different than the inner me. But what I learned in the conversation with him what, um, and being challenged by people who were from perhaps a different tribe than me within the Navy is that I had to have a diversity of communication. You know, every conversation can be loud and proud. Sometimes you have to be willing to stand close to someone and have a low level, con a low volume conversation um, that may be more intimate with that particular person. Uh, I, that's one thing. The, another thing I learned is that when you treat people with dignity and respect, no matter how they appear to be coming towards you, then that disarms them. Uh, I had particular who specifically was talking, you know, bad about a program that I had implemented for the ship. And he had a lot of negative things to say. And one day I just said, well, what do you, you know, what's, what's the right answer? Mm -hmm. Turns out it was better than mine. And so mm -hmm. I changed the policy and gave him the credit in front of all the entire ship. Good leader. And, and that's it, it disarmed Good him. leader. Dignity, you know, uh, diversity in uh, communication skills, treating people with dignity and respect. And then lastly, I'd say is knowing the difference between uh, modesty and humility. Now, uh, I actually just published an article on this, so I'm pretty fired up about it. Modesty is something that we would maybe attribute to our outward things. Humility is that inward feeling that you're not better than anyone. They're just not, 
there's some occasions where you have to be immodest because you don't have a sponsor, you don't have a mentor, and you need to be able to unfurl your uh, record to someone at the appropriate time because it's a benefit to others. When when you're willing to, as a leader, turn off your own uh, immodesty so that you can celebrate someone else, and at the same time, be immodest enough to uh, present a a skill or technique or something that you have mastered, then that shows the team that you're, you're not just uh, placating them, but you're also, you know, willing to tell the whole truth. So the the three things, three, three ways I would encourage um, your listeners and I'm encouraging myself and and you at the same time um, is that the diversity of communication, treat people with dignity and respect, and then balance that modesty, humility in your communication. So that people realize that, you know, you're not just uh, a sounding board or a glory getter. Yeah, I like that. Really, really like that. Which leads me to my next question. What are three pillars that you would say a good leader leads by? Maybe three strategies or three things that you say, hey, these are the three characteristics. And I, you might have mentioned them already in, in your ABCs, right? But I'm just curious right. if you have, these are the three things of a good leader, like, my my personal pillars, as you mentioned, are, are the ABCs, mm-hmm. um, and and that's what I encourage and and, and teach other uh, executives on how to build resilient loyal teams. Uh, I would also say, and you're right. One thing I really love that John Maxwell says is that everyone deserves to be led well, and that to me is my passion towards sharing my gift, you know, with other people. Um, three things that I would say distinguish you know, amazing leadership. Um, one is the ability to uh, build and maintain trust. Uh, now, building trust is, is a, this interesting art form of science. <laughs> so, you know, the entry point, you know, within your organization, you know, where do you start building that trust is a very uh, dynamic uh, in, entry point. And what I know is that when you're able to build trust, you create an environment within your organization um, that allows that, again, back to the dignity and respect to go throughout the organization. And that leads to my second point, which would be uh, inclusion. When everyone knows that they are trusted, when everyone realizes that your voice, um, it, it matters then you can bring in uh, a measure of inclusion where, again, that, that, that teamwork and that family environment you know, proliferates throughout the organization. And when that happened, the thir- a third thing is collaboration. It, when, when people know that there's a high level of trust from the leadership throughout all leadership within the organization, they realize that everyone has a voice they also are more willing then to share uh, innovative ideas in a collaborative nature. Uh, super quick story: I'm on a on an aircraft, on a guided missile destroyer. It's about 500 feet long. It's a workhorse of the Navy. When we pull up, when ship is underway, the way we get fuel, the way we get food and supplies is another ship will pull alongside, and we'll connect together. And, you know, get that gas tank, you know, we get the fuel in and perhaps we'll have a helicopter going back and forth, bringing stores. Well, there's only about 300 people on that ship. And so the supply folks need help bringing that food down into the reefers. The, um, the, the, in, the weapons team needs help bringing those weapons over and putting them, you know, into the armory and so forth. Mm-hmm. Well, on, on an aircraft carrier, shucks, there's over 5,000 people on board that ship. And so... Mm-hmm. Me, if I ask the folks who connect the ship together, hey, do you need some support? They're like, no, we got 120 people. We got that. No problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I ask the folks in supply, do you need help bringing food? That, no, no, no. We got over 300 people. No problem. We got it. Um, to create that environment where there's trust, where there is um, a measure, a serious, you know, authentic measure of uh, inclusion and collaboration. Well, maybe not in some evolutions, there, there may not be a reach across, you know, between departments, um, but in areas where there is a reach, for, for example, maintenance or um, combat assist or, or damage control, then they're willing to share with one another. And that makes the whole thing better. And specifically, 
our engineers and our nuclear power plant folks helped our aviation uh, maintenance people attain um, a 100% score on an aviation inspection that we had never been done in the history of the Navy. But because that team was collaborative in nature because they knew that there was a, their voice could be heard in a very inclusive way. And they trusted the entire leadership team and the culture and climate of the, uh, of the ship. We were able to attain things that had just never been done. Um, and by the way, just the bonus two, they lead to a transformative uh, workplace and they also lead to a workplace that is willing to continue to, uh, to grow. When I heard what you just said, we just said about trust, collaboration, inclu inclusion, collaboration. I think about culture within a team and creating a good culture as a as a leader amongst your group. You know, that's something that's talked about a lot in business. You know, and maybe maybe you're a listener right now, and you're saying, "Well, I don't lead a team. I'm not a business owner." If you are great, there's great content. If you're not, you have a family, you're still leading your family. You still have to create good culture. How do we create good culture and harmony as leaders in our organizations or in our home? Yeah, so I, I think a way to to create uh, that culture, uh, and, and I believe it's important to talk culture and climate, um, the way to build that culture um, let's start with trust, right? So let's say what our expectation, let's define what the culture is within the organization. Um, for example, I think it was, there was one of the, uh, automakers who is, uh, their, their culture written was quality is job one. And so here, this is the culture that we want to have your other you know, cultures you might hear, uh, people describe are. Um, we are proud, trustworthy, and bold. And so when you define, okay, here's what the culture is, that's very important. Then you create that measure of trust within the leadership of the organization because from my perspective, culture is a top-down evolution. <laughs> so when the leader is living out and displaying that culture, whether that means there's times where you have to be vulnerable about how well or, or poorly that you're actually doing, uh, when it comes down to giving a a true you know climate survey of what everybody in the within the organization feels about how you are living towards this culture that you have defined, that's important. And to get to the answer, the the most important thing is that we're willing to consistently live out the culture as a leader. And so whether that's the uh, the leader in within the household, if I say you know you've got to be home and in bed at this time and you've got to have your homework done and your chores and so forth. Well, if I'm responsible for cutting the yard and doing the hedges and washing the cars. Well, if the cars are dirty and our lawn looks like Jumanji, then I'm not doing my job. <laughs> and so for me as the leader, you know, with my children, then I've got to be living at a standard, uh, displaying the standard um, that allows that culture, you know, to, to grow and be cultivated. Now, I mentioned climate particularly in big organizations, each and every one of us is part of the climate. I, li I like to describe the climate as the culture is what's written on the wall and your public affairs, people put something together. But the climate is that feeling that you get, you know, when your tires hit the parking bumper uh, and you put the car park and you're getting ready to get out. That feeling is the climate. And as a leader, it's crucial that we assess the climate and ensure that it matters. What the, what the culture, what our desire for the culture. Um, there are some managers, you know, people managing process that they will, you know, do things right. Um, but a leader is going to do the right thing. So when a leader walks into a space, they're like a thermostat, not the thermometer. A leader walks into it and has an impact on that climate. And when we're intentional about that, then we can be successful. I love that. I love that. What year did you retire? 19, so I'm, I'm easing in. 2019, okay. Being in the military, when you were in the Navy as a, which was, this is just for my own thing, it's just, I was thinking about this this morning as I was meditating on uh, and thought on what to ask and, and where to take this, but this question came up to me. How does it feel to be in charge of, how many men were you in charge of when you're when you're out at sea? Um, well, out at sea, on an aircraft carrier, there's, there's over 5,000 on a destroyer. There's 300, 
Um, when I retired as the fleet master chief, Navy Europe, Navy Africa, about six. You know, let's just say when you were out at sea with 5,000 men and you're the top guy, top ranking guy, and everyone is dependent on your decisions. How does it feel to know you have that level of responsibility? People's lives are in your hand, hands. You have multi-billion dollars of equipment and families and so much responsibility in your hands. For, uh, first, let me say the, uh, yeah, my, my, if I could, you know, hoist, hoist at my phone right now, my, my alarm goes up at 345, probably has, you know, for the last 20 years because I'm, I'm a morning person. Uh, and so you're right. A lot of decisions are made in the silence. I too have a morning routine to that involves uh, writing, you know, my prayers and curtain. It also involves taking time to intentionally meditate and quiet myself and allow the ideas of, you know, those alpha waves to uh, be written on paper. Super important to me. Um, because of the process of advancement in the Navy, I, 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 thankfully, I didn't just miracle my way into that position. And I, I had lived through layers and layers of leadership. And in doing that, in doing that uh, it was important for me to develop relevant relationships. And because I had very intentionally and at a very authentic and raw level developed relevant relationships, making my way to become the command master chief of an aircraft carrier, uh, I knew without a, any doubt that my team was really, really strong, filled with brilliant people. And so when it came down to mission, and by the way, on a, on, a, on a naval ship, you will normally have a commanding officer, executive officer, and a command master chief known as a triad. Um, in some instances, you know, it's, it's very, um, distinctive and hierarchical and most instances though is on one level and the three of us you know make various decisions um throughout the ship and then we also have our staff and so mm -hmm. knowing that i had a strong team i was really not overly concerned about making the wrong decision because we were so intentional uh, about leadership by walking around uh and so knowing the pull what some would call the pulse of the crew um, I would describe as knowing the climate of the crew because I'm walking and talking to all of the members. And when that accountability for, you know, someone's decision and the accountability for th that may put someone's life at risk because I had 11 combat deployments, um, some on the ground and some at sea, put knowing that I had studied and spent the time to consider, you know, what is the right thing to do. Uh, allowed me not to be overly worrisome about it. And ultimately, again, we can, and by the way, I, I made some mistakes, some hardy mistakes. You're, 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 you're only human, my brother. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. But in in making those decisions, I, I couldn't second guess myself because, you know, self-doubt, you know, creates more problems than anything else. And so having a strong team, uh, doing, you know, the work, you know, well before everyone else woke up and well after they fell asleep uh, allowed me to make those decisions with a high level of confidence. And, and I would encourage leaders to do that, to be prepared. I, I studied with a, with a gentleman that said that, said something really powerful to me. His name is Keith Cunningham. I don't know if you've read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He's the actual Rich Dad a few years ago. And he wrote a book, The Road Less Stupid, and this book, and, and he said it in, in, in the workshop, business is an intellectual sport, not a tactical game. Meaning your wins are done when you're in silence, asking the tough questions and journaling and thinking. And there's another mentor I had that used to say, everyone wants success, but no one wants to do the hard work of thinking. And I think that's where, where you're getting at. Sounds, sounds like to me very similar to what both of these guys are saying. You spent time, you felt confident because you already had done the work beforehand and processing things to be prepared to make those decisions. Strategy is so important. You know, consider, you know, looking, you know, five miles down the road, you know, looking uh, in, in a ship's life, you know, looking 18 months ahead is so important. Yeah. When you have a waypoint that's out in front of you, you can work to get there. 
So it's so important that we have objectives. Uh, some might call it goal goals. If you're following Brian Tracy, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are objectives that we have out front for uh, the individual, um, for the team members, and for the organization as a whole. And when you are telling people and helping them understand their their why, right? The, we need you because this is what you bring to the table. Every sailor, for as, as an example, um, every sailor is uh, has an impact. Every profession has an impact on the lethality of the Navy. Um, and you've probably heard the story of JFK after he, you know, told NASA we're going to the moon and he went to go visit NASA. And he, there's a guy here emptying the trash, clearly uh, the janitor. And he says, well, what do you do here? And he says, I'm putting a man on the moon. Mm -hmm. So when you create that environment where everyone knows their responsibility, and again, back to trust, they believe in the organization and what that mission, vision, and guiding principles are, then you know, making decisions on the benefit of them is something that we must take seriously. And it's, it's worth it. It's worth the study time to ensure that you're doing it right. I love that. Love that. The hard work of thinking. Uh, people <laughs> think that leadership is, uh, it's, hey, the glory. It's not the glory. It's what we're doing when no one is watching. When we're in our study, journaling, meditating, <laughs> visualizing, thinking. If this, then that. And if this, then that. What's the best outcome? You know, I always ask myself, what will hold you back from achieving blah, blah, blah? Right, because it whatever that is, what's holding me back? What would hold you back from achieving whatever it is, whatever task? And it just flushes out all of the limitations and excuses, and the, and you can see it. And all of a sudden, they just become like, oh, okay, we can do this, to this, for this, for this. Most people don't want to do that. Most people don't want to live their life with intentionality, which is what that process is all about. The number one thing that people are afraid of is public speaking. Um, oh, but yeah. Yeah, so the second page, right? So people would rather be looking at the ceiling at the church mm -hmm. rather than, uh, than than giving you know the eulogy. Mm -hmm. And much the same in leadership, people would rather be you know formed up and told what to do rather than be the one you know calling cadence and telling them what to do and where to go. And those who are bold and courageous, it's just important um, that we are willing to to stand in those things. It, it's not leadership is not just. Um, but how to say it, being linguistically, you know, dynamic, intellectually agile, and the willingness to build that steel is what helps people become better. I'll share this quick story with you. I'm going to say, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago, my kids are all grown now. My youngest is 21 years old. And we were in the, we were in the kitchen in our old house. And I said to them, I put them all around the kitchen table, the whole family. And I said, Hey guys, what do you think the highest paying career is going to be of your generation? And of course, they were giving me, they were all giving me their ideologies, doctors, lawyers, this, that, all, all these, all these different things. And I said, in my opinion, the highest paid career of the future is going to be the best communicator, which indeed is the best leader because all you guys, because I remember at that time, all the kids were doing was texting. That's the way they wanted to communicate. Just text. I would call, I, even to this day, if you're listening to me, Molly, my little sister, which my brother-in-law is a retired military uh, Marine. He just retired this year. I call her, she wants to text me, right? And I'm like, hey guys, in, in that AI hadn't come out yet, right? This was talking 10 years ago. AI wasn't out yet. I said, the best communicator, the one that can put a team together, lead the team, communicate, and be able to have that human-to-human -human connection, that art is being lost right now by your generation because all you guys want to do is text. You don't want to have a real conversation and leaders in, I, I don't believe this is going to go away because we're human beings. As a human being, a leader, the leaders are the ones that are going to be paid the best, but you have to have that ability to be able to connect with another human being. You have to be able to, to have that empathy. And I was walking with my son the other day, we were out for a walk and he, and, and the conversation came up and I said, you know, so I, we all have a gift. God gives us all a gift. We we just have to figure out what that gift is. God's gift to me is my ability to just connect with the people. So my final question to you, brother, is was there something that you didn't share that you should have shared that would bring a tremendous amount of value to the listener? First of all, you're a fabulous host, man. You've asked a great question. Uh, and I think our conversation 
has allowed me, you know, to express the things that um, fuel, you know, my desire to make the world a better place. Uh, I started Camp Solution just to change the world. No big deal. Um, the difference, though, is I believe that if we take leaders and create that environment for them to do the things we've discussed um, from the the ABCs of leadership, treating people with dignity and respect, um, you know, having the mindset of trust, innovation, uh, and um, communicating and collaboration, then imagine that person goes to work and they're, they know that's what they're walking into. Um, they know they're going to be in this environment that's going to be fulfilling and stimulating and they're going to be treated with honor, with dignity and respect. They, they will take that home mm-hmm. and they'll do that with their household. And then from their household, they'll go out and do that within the community. And so it, this has been just a fabulous conversation to talk about those things. Um, uh, uh, of course, I, I have written some of those things uh, in my, my book, uh, which is available on Amazon, um, Building Resilience for Hybrid Success. And those are the, the points that uh, proud to me. Ten two-letter words also, you know, those are the things that uh, I'm most concerned with helping people with. You know, I want you to give all of that information in a minute, how people connect with you if they wanted to connect with you. But before that, I had another question while I was sure. checking this morning that I wanted to ask you. So you worked for, you know, our country is very polarized right now as with political parties. So you worked for both leaders, right? Both oppositions. You you worked under both administrations, the Trump administration and, and part of the Biden administration. Can you share with us as a military person, and leadership, what were the differences, if any, in administration? If, if there is any, I'm just curious to know. Well, be traditionally, and you're right. So from Ronald Reagan up to President Obama, uh, I, I, and up to President Trump, I served under all those administrations. Uh, on met time, man. Wow. On time. You met every president? With the exception of uh, Donald Trump. Wow. And what I know is that, and, and they may have been speaking at an event, I happen to be at the handshake line. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, got so I did have some interesting conversations with um, W. Bush and with uh, folks close to the uh, Obama administration. But what what happened, just very frankly, is that it appeared that the Republican Party was more willing to fund uh, the military. So we got really big raises with uh, when the Republicans were in office, uh, and under the hand of the de- Democratic. Um, presidents we I, I was on board ships by the way when we went from all male crew on combatant ships to bringing females on board i was in a leadership role during that time i was also in leadership role when um i think it's president clinton who, who established the don't ask don't tell environments and leadership role and when it was repealed by president obama again in a leadership role um those gave a feeling you know to those who are opposed to those events that the uh the democrats were you know more along those lines and the republicans were the ones who were paying us well so on and so forth they were the tough guys when it comes down to going to iraq afghanistan and so forth from my perspective every military uh leader it comes from when i joined the navy in the 80s is that every military person should be apolitical you know, there should be two words for the president, right? It, it, his perspective or her perspective one day when we get there, when it comes down to going to this country and that, yeah, it, it should, it's, it's right to that. And because we must have a trust in the checks and balances that go from the president to our particular mission. One thing I will say um, before, as I close, I should, in this particular topic, the one time in my career, again, from President Reagan uh, I've been to every inhabited continent. I've been to the East Coast and West Coast, by the way, of every inhabited continent. I've talked wow. in a very diplomatic way to heads of state uh, to include um, some of the, the leaders that we don't necessarily have a, a high reputation for right now. And I've talked to heads of state. They've flown the American flag because I was visiting and speaking to those folks. But one only, on, only with our former president, had I ever had this particular experience I'm going to describe. So I was at the airport in, um, uh, in, in Paris. And it was, I was asking the lady who was uh, checking us in at the gate because there is a delay or something. Um, and as I was talking to her, 
you know, there was a line that would run behind me and she said, you're American. And I was like, I am and this passport and so forth. But I said, yeah, I am. And she says, I feel so sorry for you. And the three people behind me were like, yeah, wow. Verbally. Wow. It was kind of rich. so embarrassing uh, to be an American right now. We really feel sorry for you and your country. And I had never experienced that in my entire career. That was a bit heartbreaking. Um, at, at, that was probably the most painful moment. I wasn't in uniform, but I was, um, I was trying to make somebody close, but as I was a uniform member, uh, active duty member. Mm-hmm. And that, our heart more than just a little bit. And you're right. We are in a very polarizing uh, time right now, which is why it's so important, you know, that our vote truly, truly counts. I, I know you mentioned that military personnel kind of feels, hey, the Republicans pay us well, Democrats, whatever. What was that like for you as a leader when the don't ask, don't tell thing happened and you had to navigate that, right? Because the orders come from the top, boom, 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 and now you're the boots on the ground. Like it's, you're it, you're the one on the boat and <laughs> not, or on the ship, right? Not the boat, but the ship. And you have to actually yeah. implement these things. It, it is a particularly, you know, growing up with the belief system that I had, it was, it was really difficult. But what, what I knew, uh, is that the, the policy had been written. It's kind of like playing basketball. If you get fouled, the referee's not going to unblow his whistle. Um, well, now he didn't replay, but mm-hmm. in the day, Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're not going to blow their whistle. So there, what I was able to come to grips with was a uh, a very emotional thing for me. I was very, I grew up in a very machismo environment, you know, 70s, 80s, be a man, all those things. And a woman told me one time, she said, you know, the discrimination that women deal with, the misogyny that women deal with is the same as racism. And I thought, what? No. But as I reasoned that in my mind, I thought, wow, the similarities are amazing. And so as I, again, I'm in a leadership role, bang, here comes that don't ask, don't tell. I'm like, wow, somebody's got to be the champion for these folks. And I'm the leader. Therefore, it has to be me. And so to not necessarily, you know, roll, roll in, you know, some kind of picket sign or anything like that, but to be able to say, Here's what the policy is. Understand here's what it is. And here's how we're going to operate going forward. And to be able to inspire unity in that environment, particularly when we, there was some very harsh lines against homosexuality at the time was one of the toughest things that, that, uh, that occurred, you know, throughout my career, um, that LGBTQ LGBTQ plus, I guess now, community, was, it really, really had a hard time coming in and being able to set aside my personal beliefs um, for the mission, vision, and guiding principles of our Navy was uh, a challenge, but it was worth it. And it was worth it because they're brilliant minds who may come from a different belief system, uh, may have a, an alternative lifestyle or whatever the case may be. Those those people are still, you know, patriots. And when they're there to be patriotic and do their level best at what they do, then we've got to celebrate, recognize, and encourage their continued service. I think more important before they're patriots are human beings just like you and I. So we need to respect them as as such. I think first and foremost. And let's respect each other. Let's love each other. You're a human being. I'm a human being. Let's connect on that level then beliefs are different. I, I don't care. I don't care if you're Muslim, Jewish, it don't matter to me. You're, yeah. We're going to the same human experience. As human beings, we're yeah. going to the same human. You feel what I feel. You see, yeah. Just let's just not push each other's ideologies. Let's respect each other. Let's love each other. But we're both human beings and we're going yeah. through the same human experience. The thing is, what if, what if everybody's right? You know, yeah. I, I don't proselytize. I don't need to, I, 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 if you ask me what I think or what I believe, I'll share that with you. And I'd love more to listen to you, you know, if it's different. But what I know is that a rising tide floats all boats. Yeah. A rising tide floats all boats. So we've got to be the tide. That's what leaders do. Yeah. yeah I love that. I, I know I keep telling you last question. I promise you this is the last one. Cause I'd love, I, I love, I love Ronald Reagan. So here I have someone that 
can tell me what their experience was. Ronald Reagan, right? One of, in my opinion, one of the best, one of the best presidents uh, and leaders of of my generation. At least, I was a baby, but at least uh, in history, from what I've studied, great, great res- president of our time. How was that working for Ronald Reagan? He was, a, in my opinion, I think he was an amazing leader. I've read his books and studied studied him. How was that well, being in military under under Ronnie? Well, I, I'll sit. I, yeah, I'm a full disclosure guy, sure. and uh, I remember vividly when he was running for president, and um, I remember hearing. I, I was asking my father, I, I well, my stepfather, uh, and I, I was like, "Well, what's the big deal about him being an actor?" Mm-hmm. And he said. Because he could very well be acting. <laughs> so, that was a good answer, by the way. That was a really good answer. That was a really good I thought, oh, okay, but because I was I was young, uh, and didn't fully know the intimacies of politics and mm-hmm. so forth. And so, as I entered in he, into the Navy, of course, he had been he was on his second term at the time, and he he carried a, a way he had a. Um, Kind of an elegant, um, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, he he was elegantly fierce. I mean, he was clearly no punk. If you do something against the United States, we are going to answer in a ferocious way. And so, because he displayed that with a level of elegance, very similar from my perspective of uh, President Obama. Obama was never. Um, like the bully and figure the forehead type of guy, but we were making some, some things happen in a very quiet way, not necessarily celebrated by the open press. Um, but the, and that's how it was with Reagan. Reagan, he 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 was so graceful um, in the way that he spoke, uh, and that his ability to be articulate was important, uh, and the relationships that he had abroad very very important. Mm-hmm. Which and is brings me to mind to President Obama, who had the same type of relationship with people abroad, and inspiring, you know, people, uh, particularly on the continent of Africa. So to be able to um, serve with during the time of Ronald Reagan uh, and see, you know, the, and hear the way he felt about the military was very, very fulfilling. And, and we we haven't, from my perspective, and to your point, we haven't had a president who authentically respected and honored and revered. Agreed. We just haven't had that. I, I think, in my opinion, um, as it pertains to presidents, I think he, he's been one of the great, greatest ones that I've seen in my lifetime um, while I was a kid. But, man, um, from the history books and just the way, he artic- the way he protected our country, he was strong, but not a bully. Right. right? Um, he would get his point across. Don't don't mess with us, or I'm gonna crush you. But not in a bullish way. Um, people right. respected us, and uh, it, it was. Uh, I, I think he was, uh, and I, and I believe also to your father, your stepfather's point, that a lot of uh, a lot of those relational skills that he had had to also comes from his acting skills, right? That has a play. That has a, there's a flavor of that, right? Being able to yeah. have strong relationships, you, you, if you're a thinking person, you would, you would have to say, "Hey, there's a, there's a version of that that is, that is being used, and some of those skills are being deployed to, to impact relationships out there." Absolutely, especially internationally, you know, and right. again, traveling, and, and I you know, love combat deployments and, and lots of times overseas and dealing with people from different countries and no, again, from him all the way, you know, through our former presidents, you can feel the American presence, um, when that is displayed by the president. Uh, and, and one thing I'll say about this is about all this is that, you know, the, the ubiquitous nature of news now, uh, and reporting, is very very different. We didn't have the twenty four hour news cycle. We didn't have you know the CNN, the Fox News, and the MSNBC, and all those things that are just only. Now. It's weird to have a channel called Headline News, but mm-hmm. 
to have the news, you know, 24 seven, we didn't have that, you know, at the time. And it al allowed, you know, for uh, a different level of communication than what we have, you know, these days. And I think that because of the things that were, you know, not seen, not said about, you know, presidents into our past compared to presidents that we have now and into our future, they're, they will, you know, have a measure of, of, of glory, you know, in the annals of history different than what we'll have going into the future. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Man, what a great conversation. Thank you so much uh, yeah. for coming on. What an amazing conversation. And I'm glad we went. We went a little longer than I wanted to, but I'm glad we did because I just had a bunch of things in my head I wanted to, to get to nice. you. So thank you so much. If folks wanted to connect with you, how do they, where do they find you? How do they get coaching from you? Maybe there's a company leader out there listening to us and saying, man, I want him to come and coach me. I want him to come and teach my team and I want him to teach my executive team. How do they find you? Tell us about your book. Where can they find your book? I'm going to pick up your book, by the way. That's my next read. So guys, that's what I'll be reading next. So read it along with me. All right. Um, so how can they connect with you, brother? Social media, give it, give it, give it, give us all, give it, a, give it to us all. So, so the the best way, uh, particularly for those who are looking for a keynote speaker, uh, off so offsite, you know, speaker, or do, maybe even to do some small group coaching, uh, is through LinkedIn, uh, and I can be found there at, at uh, Raymond Kemp, um, and that's the the best way to get me professionally. And if you're you're curious to, you know, what I'm thinking about. I, I post articles there as well as on medium.com and I post, you know, stories and, uh, some articles on, uh, Instagram as well. And there you can find me at Raymond D Kemp. That's Raymond D Kemp. Uh, and that's the same handle that I use on Twitter as well as Facebook as well. Raymond D Kemp on all social media. And, you know, please, oh, please connect with me on, on LinkedIn. Uh, and I'd love to, you know, share some insights and learn from your, your listeners. Cause I mean, I know you got some smart listeners out there. I'm always seeking to improve my perspective. Yeah. Some good, and, good oh, talks out there. The, my, my book is, um, building resilience for hybrid success. The subtitle is anchored in adaptability. Uh, and it grew out of an interesting conversation. You know, some, I was talking to a leader and I was like, man, what a great time to be a leader. And he was saying, oh, you just don't understand these young people today are, you know, blah, blah, blah. Millennials, this generation Z, that. And it turned, it went from a text response to an email response to a, you know, I've got more to say into a book. And so, uh, in the book, I was talking about, you know, ways to build loyalty and resilience, uh, maybe some tips and techniques and key things to think about, uh, for leaders. So please, oh, please make your way to Amazon. Uh, again, it's building resilience for hybrid success. It's my only book that's posted there now. So if you just put my name in, it'll come right up. Are you on audible yet? Not yet. Not yet. I, I'm let's get you on there, brother. Let's get you on there. Cause a lot of, uh, a lot of the listeners listen to audible. So try to get on, try to get on there as soon as you can. Thank you brother for coming on. Thank you guys for listening. And stay with us this long. We went for a little bit longer than I wanted to, but thank you so much for your time, brother. Really appreciate it. It's really an enriching conversation. I learned a ton from you. And that's what this is all about. I hope that the listeners, you listening to me right now, that you your life was made better by listening to this conversation and the wisdom that, that Ray shared here with us. I hope that you can take some of the things that he shared here today and your life becomes better by taking action on some of the things that, that he shared. If it is to be, it is up to me. That's my biggest takeaway. And remember that, guys. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you. Later.